And she thinks, ah, I work for the United States. So she gets herself into a horrible situation. Because every time she gets money out of an innocent person, she is liable for that money. She caused him the damage in Shamaim. Because she had never permission to work for such an entity. But that's not even the biggest problem. There's a much bigger problem. Now this innocent person will go to jail, to jail for five years. His children will grow up without a father. The wife will be like a widow. And the children without the father in the house, there's a much higher chance they go off the derech. They leave the religion. They're not doing good in school. They're depressed. They're sad. Someone offered them drugs. You know how the next thing, they're on the street. That's it. The yeshiva kicked them out. And these three boys turns into secular, bitter, anti-religion boys. Why? Why God sent my father to the jail? That's how they look at it. I grew up without a father five years and have a father in the house. My mother was miserable. We, got, we became poor. They took away all our money. They froze our bank account. That's what they do for inside information. That's what they do. The FBI, the, the FCC, FCC. And now those three boys will marry Goyot. And they will have children. And one of these children will be Adolf Hitler. Who's going to pay for it? The judge. Whatever is going to come out of it. She's going to say for her protection, what do you want from me? I act according to the rules of the United States. Then Hashem will ask her, who is, what rules are more important? The rules of my court or the rules of Joe Biden? Or Al Sharpton? Or Jesse Jackson? Or Jimmy Carter? Or anybody else that worked here in America? and made rules in Congress. Which rules you are loyal to? To my laws, the laws of the Torah and Shulchan Aruch, and the law of the poskim of the generation, or the law of the Goish people in the United States court? What is she going to say? If she will say, of course, you Hashem, is going to show her 5,000 cases that she went against these rules, and the consequences of the action. And in case you're still not convinced, there is a verse in the book of Yirmiya, Jeremiah, Meshalem la'adam kepri ma'alalav. I pay the, the individual according to the fruits of his actions. Not according to his actions, according to the fruits of his actions. Meaning, you build the yeshiva, you're not just getting paid for the one million dollar it, it costs you to build that place and renovate it. No. That's one reward. The income will be according to every minute how much Torah has been learned in that building. Another year and another year and another year, forever and ever. And how many secular people came to that yeshiva for a day to try and became Baalei Tshuva. Also, the person that built the building also get rewarded for them and for their children and grandchildren until the end of days. And if you build a club, working on Shabbat, drugs everywhere, shrimps and pork everywhere, intermarriage everywhere, abortions everywhere. You know what happened in the clubs. I don't have to tell you. Goish music, horrible, dirty mouths over there, making people becoming more and more wicked according to, those, to this lifestyle over there. He has to be punished for everything that come out of that building forever and ever. You understand, Rabotai Makurepo? That's why we have to be very, very careful. You go against one rule of Hashem, the consequences of that can be fatal, can be devastating, can destroy you for eternity. You put in jail one innocent person and according to the Torah is righteous. Do you know what's waiting for you? And now you're going to say for your protection, it broke my heart, really. When they, took, they, when they put that religious Jew in jail for inside trading, it broke my heart. But I'm a judge in United States court. I, I had to rule according to the rules of, of United States. I had no other way. 
It's not that it's, it wasn't in my hand. If it was up to me, I would let him go home and release all the money. But I'm a judge. Who told you to be a judge? Who gave you permission? Do you know one kosher rabbi in the world that will approve such thing? Don't you understand that even mezuzah you're not allowed to put in a secular court? They put, but it's not allowed to put over there a mezuzah. Just, just like you don't put a mezuzah in a store that sells pork meat, and you don't put a mezuzah in prostitution home. That's spitting at Hashem. That's not respecting Hashem. Putting a mezuzah in such a place. So that's what's happening. So everyone, wow, Raita Ech, he got her. Well, he's the hero of the Haredim. Why? Because the Haredim already lost a long time ago the right Ashkafa. They totally lost it. That's why the Haredim buy all these magazines here every day in Brooklyn for Shabbat and in Monsi and in Lakewood when these magazines are mass murder machines. They put heretic speakers to write weekly column over there. People that bring priests into their synagogue to preach. People that are Christian missionary. They bring into the synagogue and this religious magazine give them a weekly, weekly page to write their nonsense and their rotten ashkafa. And people bring it into the house to destroy the souls of their children and nobody understands what they even do. Someone came to me and said, I read an article in this magazine. In Shabbat, in Shul, Monsi. They mention you over there. I'm going to bring it to you. I said, don't bring it to me. I don't want to hold this filth in my hand. Wow, you, you should read it. They're someone that you made Baal Tshuva, they talked about it. I don't know. I'd rather not know. Don't even tell me the story. I don't know the story. Don't even stop. I don't want to hear it. Why? This is a mass murder machine. It's against Hashem. Just the advertisement over there, such a low level of lifestyle. Sure, Cancun, Las Vegas, Miami, cruise, boats, Pesach over here, Pesach over there, five stars hotel. I call Gashmi. Nothing is spiritual there. Much like Goim. Goim 100%. That's how the Goim admire this physical pleasure everywhere. It's the main thing in their life. They used to have a song here in America 30 years ago. Everybody is working for the weekend. That was the song. What does it mean? We have to be slaves for five days. That's Saturday and Sunday. We will have the life. We get drunk. We go naked to places and the rest, whatever they do. That was, that's the American culture. Why the name of America, it's America? Uma Reka. Empty nation. Nation with nothing. No culture, no civilization. Nothing. They preach to Israel about the Palestinians, knowing the Palestinians don't belong in Israel. The land belongs to, is to, is to the Jews. They read about it in their churches here in Texas, Washington, everywhere. So they know that the land belongs to the Jews. But they don't care what they know. It's politics. They want to kiss up to the Arabs. Why are you torturing the Palestinians? Why you took their land? They already forgot what they did to the Indians over here. <laughs> A billion times worse than what they claim we do to the Palestinians. They forgot. And not only that, they make a national holiday. Thanksgiving. No, no, there's no thanksgiving. It's thanks taking. <laughs> Change the name. You liars. Thanksgiving. Imagine now I robbed you for your Rolex and I make an annual, annual holiday. What? Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving what? God gave me $100,000 Rolex. Everyone will make a joke out of it, right? Come on, give it back. No, God gave it to me. <laughs> and then someone else did the same thing and I preached to him shame on you why you steal the Rolex to this miserable person this is what's happening here you don't know if to laugh or to cry
on Shabbat, we saw exactly what does it mean to be a politician. You look like a religious Jew. From the outside, you look like you act like a very important religious Jew. You have a key position. You are a president of a tribe. You are in a VIP league. And you're nothing but a low level of selfish politician. We saw it with the spies, besides Yoshua and Kalev, how they're willing to let the entire Jewish nation go down the drain, lose the promise that Hashem gave us to go to the Holy Land because they're about to lose their job. They won't be as important. Right now, everyone kiss his hand. Once they go to Israel and Yoshua become the leader, no one will pay attention to me. I won't be such important as I was. So what do I do? I modify the whole truth. But I want to ask you a question. Do you think the spies did it intentionally? Or the spy? But what I want to ask is, if you took the spies after their speech that caused the entire Jewish nation to cry, and you connect them to a lie detector, they would pass the test or no? What do you think? Now you take the spies, they say that there are giants, and there are so many funerals, and there are walls, we will never be able to break the walls. Moshe said, if there are walls, that means these people are cowards. And they are weak. When you are weak, you have to make a wall. We, the Israelis, we used to be strong 40 years ago. Meaning our army used to be really good. Now it's very weak. So what do we do? We need to make a wall between us and the Palestinian murderers. Because if not, hundreds of them will come in and shoot us. You see that it happens anyway. But there was the thought 10, 15 years ago when they build that wall. Then come the Supreme Court, who helps the Hamas, of course, and told us to open the walls and give the Palestinian access into Israel. And that day, they already had a massive attack. The day they took out a part of the wall, they already attacked us that day. They didn't wait a day. So when you have a big wall, that means you're weak. Someone that live with confidence that no one will dare to hurt him? Does he make around his property a big wall and cameras and guards and security? No. Why? Who is going to dare to mess with me? But when you have so many walls and so many security measures, that means you're shaking. Right or wrong? That's what Moshe said. It wasn't my opinion. And what did they say? They are massive. We won't be able to break through these walls. We have no chance. Now, when we connect them to a light detector, I promise you they would pass the test. When they spoke about the giant, they would swear with the Torah that it's true. They are giants. When they spoke about the walls, they would swear. They are walls. When they speak about so many funerals, there were funerals. Hashem made funerals there. Why? That the Goim will be busy with their funerals and they won't see that there are spies walking for 40 days around the land. You know, in the old days, right away, you see strangers are walking in the land. Immediately, they'll call the police and arrest them. What, who are you? Where you came from? Show me your passport. What language you speak? Right away, they'll detect them. I'll tell you a story. I, I know one guy that uh, he was legal here in America. He had green card, but his wife didn't. Two Israeli people. Uh, this story is from over 25 years ago. His wife could not suffer anymore not seeing her family in Israel. He told her, if you go, you're not, not going to be able to come back. You are burned. They're not going to let you in. Someone told her, don't worry. You pay $2,000 and we will smuggle you through the Indians in Canada. Somewhere, I don't know exactly, there's a lake, river, some town in the end of the world. 
2,000 back then was like almost 20,000 today. It was a lot of money. In those days, I used to pay rent $500 a month for two bedrooms. 25 years ago in Queens, in Main Street. Now it's probably 2,500. So five times more. It will be probably like 10,000 today. But Baruch Hashem, her husband was pretty wealthy. He's willing to pay someone to bring her in. And they did. How the immigration caught her? The people in that town were working for the immigration. The immigration told them, every person you see is a, you know, is a suspect, you have suspicion towards him, looks like a tourist, doesn't belong to your town, is a stranger in town, give us a call. Every illegal person that smuggled into the United States that we will catch, we will give you some kind of a benefit. I don't know, money, whatever they gave them. As soon as she came in, she walked to a supermarket. The, the cashier <laughs> called the immigration. By the time she went out to the parking, she was already arrested and sent back to Israel. Why is it? Everyone detects someone stranger. What is this? Who is this woman? It's a small town. Everyone knows everyone. Excuse me, who are you? Where are you from? She started probably to speak with her Israeli accent. So, oh, really? Have a nice day. Welcome to America. Hey, Joe, I got someone for you. <laughs> White Chrysler. Hurry up. Tov. <clears throat> Pick up your check later. <laughs> That's how it was. So over here, Hashem makes a lot of funerals that they don't have the mind now to pay attention. They're all busy with the funerals. So what, how did they translate it? It's a cursed land. Eretz ochelet yoshvea. If we're going to move there, we're also going to have a lot of funerals. We're going to die. Look, all we saw is funerals. If you connect them to a lie detector, do you believe what you just say? 100%. We're petrified. We're afraid to go to Israel. This is going to be our burial over, over there. Now I'm going to tell you a little story and you're going to, and you're going to understand how we're going to connect the two stories together. The spies and what I'm about to tell you. One uh, woman said, we are very happy from our son-in-law. We got lucky with him. He's a great guy. Every morning... He bring my daughter coffee to the bed. Oh, wow, so lucky. What an important son-in-law. And our daughter-in-law is such a klepte. She makes my son bring her everyday coffee to the bed. We can't stand her. Did you hear what I just said? You didn't pay attention. You pay attention or no? I will repeat. <laughs> they say, she say, she and her husband say, how do you like your son-in-law? Oh, we love him. Such a great guy. We got so lucky with him. Every morning he brings coffee. You have to see how he brings coffee to my daughter to bed. Such a great guy. A real gentleman. So, what about your daughter-in-law? Oh, I can't stand her. The real witch. Why? She make my son bring her coffee to bed every morning. Do you understand now? Two transactions, exactly identical. Ruven brings coffee to a girl to the bed. Shimon brings coffee to the girls to the bed. One transaction, oh, delighted, great, amazing, tzaddik. One, shame on you. you, you. Why? Depend if I benefit from it or not. If I got something in it, kosher, approve, tzaddik, I love him. If it's against me or towards the, my enemy, or oh, Rasha, how can he dare do such thing? Every one of us, with some very rare exception to the rules, every one of us live in such contradiction Every second of our life. 
every second of our life. 100%. If you're not convinced, check the duty for, do a, a jury duty. You take 12 people, sit them in a court. If they are black and the defendant is a black person, he's going to go home today. If it's Hasidim sit there and the defendant is a Hasid, he will go home today. If it's white Nazis, KKK, whatever you call them, and the defendant is Nazi, he will go in today, he will go home today. If it's Israeli and the Judy, uh, jury duty are Israelis, or Jews in general, he will go home today. If it's an Arab or any Muslim, and there are Muslims in the jury duty, he's going home. That's how O.J. Simpson went free, and many other cases. So you, might, you may say, wait a minute, that, those are regular citizens. This one is a tailor, this one is a driver, this one is a doctor. What do they know about judgment? What do they know about the court? Obviously, they're not objective. They're not professional judges. You need real judges, like in Israel. Three judges sitting in a court. Oh, yeah? So let me tell you a story. One person, Haredi, black hat and a beard, was sued by a wicked person. The wicked person is reform. Anti-Torah, hate Torah, hate Haredim. Those kind of people, they both come to court. The reform sue the Orthodox Haredi. The judge is a liberal lefty woman. Young. Looks like 40 years old. As soon as she sees in front of her Reform Rasha and Haredi Tzadik, she begins to attack the Haredi. The trial didn't start. She said to the lawyer, of the reform, tell me, how come you only sue for that? I see another cause here for a lawsuit. You didn't pay attention that this and this happened also? Why didn't you sue for that? That's not a lawsuit, you little low life. You're supposed to be a judge, not an attorney or a prosecutor. You have to judge the case in front of you. Why are you giving one side advice? How to hurt the religious pe person? Because I can't stand him. He comes from our subconscious. It's like a Nazi will see a Jew now. He's going to take his side in a court in Berlin, 1933. It's no chance. You're lucky I let you live. You want to be not guilty in a court? Can't even sit on a bench where I sit. How, do you, how can I take your side? So what happened? Listen to this, but I won't believe it. That happened recently in Israel, recently. She said to the religious guy, are you sure you want to go with the trial or you want to surrender and we'll finish it today? If you surrender, I will have some mercy on you. If you don't and you lose, it can cost you a lot more than what the lawsuit is. You know, there are other fees that you're probably not aware of. Look, she's already intimidating him. Then she said to him, you religious from birth or you Baal Tshuva? He said, I'm Baal Tshuva. She said, so you probably saw Chiloni movies in your past. He said, yes, I did. So she named uh, a name of a movie, famous comedy. You saw that movie? Told her, yes. Do you remember what the actor named such and such? said while he was boiling Turkish coffee, he said, when you make Turkish coffee, you have to know exactly when to take the coffee off the fire. A second before it spills out. It's overflow. That's your situation right now. It's about to boil and spill out. You sure you want to go on with the trial? He already realized the case is already finished before it started. 
She doesn't want to see evidence, dark, nothing. She decided to finish it right away because she saw a religious person. So he said, let me go speak to my lawyer outside. He goes out. The lawyer says, it's a, it's a done deal. Better to surrender and pay a smaller fine than to go with them because the more you fight with them, the more they will bury you. This is right now the situation in Israel. Yes, 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 exactly like that. If you're going to find one judge that is objective and he has nothing against religious people, good luck with that. Check a thousand, you won't find one. They watch television all day and all they hear, Haredim, 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 Haredim. They hate the Haredim. He's a judge, he's a human being, what do you think? Whatever he watched on TV, already he made, he made up his mind. Huh? You think they're dumb? What do you think the judge does before you come to his courtroom? They first see the document and they Google who you are. Especially if you're someone famous. Some kind of a president or something. They Google, they check what the article's about you. They want to know as much as they can. That's how they make their verdicts. So, when your son... When your son is serving his wife, giving her coffee to the bed, she's such a witch. She's taking advantage on my son. We can't stand her. Ah, but when your son-in-law does the same thing to your daughter, ah, it's so great. That's what the human being is all about. And that's what I've been trying to educate my listeners for almost 30 years by now. That if you will be like that, you will never be righteous. If you will be a politician, I judge based on he's with me, with my group or not. You know, there is a bird called Hasidah. Hasid, Hasidah. What Hasid means? Hasid today means someone that loves kugel, gefilte fish, chulent, fleisch, l'chaim. You know, Torah, davening, you know, and all kinds of other things. Hasid, according to the Torah, has nothing to do with how you dress and this, and that's, that's not what it means. Hasid means above righteous. There is righteous, and there is extra righteous, and upgraded righteous that is also willing to do things that is not obligated. He will always buy the best mezuzot and the best feeling for his children. He can buy kosher, half a price. No, I want handmade, and I want this, and I want that. Oh, what do you, oh there's also this. Do that. Do this. The Gemara brings an example of the Tanaim, how they would slaughter a calf for Shabbat, and then they saw something fattier, better. Immediately they put this away and took the better one and made. Why? For Shabbat, we want the best. And there are many other examples like that. That's called Midat Hasidut. There is a bird, they call her Hasida. What kind of Hasida she is? Satmer, Bobov, Bells, I don't know. But she's Hasida. Why they call her Hasida? We'll find out in a minute. Hasida. Hasida. Okay, you know what? I'll tell you since you have no patience to wait. I'll tell you. Okay, I surrender. So Hasida, because she does Hasadim to her friends. There's a group of Hasidot. There's this Hasida and that Hasida. They need help. She always helps. If that's the case, she's a great righteous bird. Why she's not kosher? Usually, by birds, birds that attack their victims and murder them are not kosher. Owl, eagle, those kind of birds, they cruel, they attack, they rip your neck. They're not kosher. Hashem doesn't want us to eat them. Birds that are being attacked, usually kosher. Hasidah is a murderer? No. Hasidah doesn't attack any other birds. It eats worms and stuff from the floor, you know. So why it's not kosher? Should be very kosher. Kind, 
full of chasadim, and not a murderer. Why it's not kosher? Because the chasida is a lousy politician. If she's a lefty, she only let other lefties talk. Righties are excluded. Democracy is only for us, not for you. We run the show. You don't have a say. You want to help the poor? Are you from our Hasidut? No, I'm from a different Hasidut. Go to your Hasidut, let them help you. Over here we help only this group. Over here only this group is allowed to learn and to pray. Over here only this kind of people allowed to play basketball. Go to your own community and play over there. There's nothing Hashem hates more than that. Pure racism, and to be honest with you, pure stupidity. Because if you're a little bit clever, little, if you learn Torah, you would already know that Hashem cannot stand you. So why you go on with this racism and politics? Why? Why? Yes, sir. What do you think? That a racist, he doesn't know that what he does is wrong? He does. Why he continue to do it? Yetzerara. Just like the person that eats too much. Yetzerara. He knows it's bad for him. He knows he's gaining weight and it's hard and he cannot walk up the stairs and he gets all kinds of other diseases already on the way and he still cannot stop. He knows this Goya will destroy his life, but he can stop. He knows the, the smoking grass destroying his brain and destroying his life and he can't get married already for eight years, but he can stop. Is a weak character. Weak character. Sometimes you have sons, you warn them not to start with cigarettes. Needless to say drugs. You give them speeches, you preach, you try, you do, you do, all kinds of things. And in the end, they do it anyway. Why? Peer pressure. Friends, yeah, be a man. Kadima, don't be a loser. Try one. No, no, I'm good. Listen, listen. You want to be with us? You have to be with us all the way. We don't accept you one leg here, one leg there. And that's how they do it. And that's how all the kids go off the way. Destroy their life. I, when I was a child, my father warned me very much. Very much. With serious strictness. Never to dare to smoke cigarettes. And he used to give me an example from him how much he suffered because he's addicted to cigarettes. One time we had to walk more than three hours to look for a pack of cigarettes because there was a strike in Israel. And you know, after a meal, they must have a cigarette. They must. They'll burn the country if they won't get a cigarette. And we walk from one store to another, to another, to another. Yo, we circled the whole city. Sold out, sold out. No cigarettes. Ah. See, look, look, you learn, learn how much I suffer. You see? You should never ever touch cigarettes. Oh, Baruch Hashem, he did a very convincing job. Sometimes you teach your children how to be, and sometimes you have to teach them how not to be. That's also a good lesson. For instance, sometimes you set a good personal example. You love Torah, you learn Torah, you watch your mouth. You're a great person and they learn from you how to be. But what happens if you're a loser? If you're not so religious? If you're not such a great davener? If you're not such a great learner? So how are you going to teach your kids to be righteous if you're barely 5% righteous? There's so many issues with you. What are you going to do? What are you going to tell them? Learn from Abba? <laughs> know exactly where he's going to end. So you have to do reverse psychology. Look at me, what a loser I am. Look at me, how weak I am. You should daven for me, look. See, you don't want to be like me. Look what I do, look what I did, look how I fail, look how I cannot control myself. Look how, how much weight I get. Look how much I did this. Look how, my, how I cough. Look how much I suffer. I could have had another apartment without these cigarettes. All my money goes to this garbage. I can't breathe. When you walk up the stairs, 
What happened, Abba? Go, go, I'll come later. Look, you see how much I suffer? That also work. The child is beginning to worry. Wow, I hope I'm never going to be like that. But he has pressure from friends. So when I used to go to school, that's when they only started to smoke. There was one guy in my class, 8th grade, started to smoke cigarettes in the city of Batyam. Everyone in Batyam knew that he's the criminal of the city. Because he was 13 and a half, started to smoke cigarettes. Everyone was shocked. Remember, it's a secular city. I'm not talking Bnei Brak here. It's not Lakewood. It was a city on a beach with 99% secular people. One guy started to smoke. All parents went crazy. Warned their kids, stay away from him. Be careful from this guy. Later, after a few years, just like you know, when one thing and another one and another one, later on, it became a pandemic. So people used to tell me, no, try one in the army. No, come on, have one with us. Don't be a loser. So I found a good way to answer. I said, no, I'm not the loser. You are the loser. I'm the only winner here. Well, how come? Look at you. Such weak people. You kill for a little lousy cigarette. You can have, you're not independent. You have no freedom. You are a slave of such desire. I'm free. I don't need it. I can stand it. I can even smell you. Ugh. <laughs> Disgusting. I worked. You have to come with confidence. But most kids are not like that. A little pressure and they, and they surrender. That's what's happening today. So you want to be righteous? Rule number one, the truth must be always above what's in it for me. This doesn't exist. I'm not a factor here. First, the truth. Doesn't matter who say that. I like him, I hate him. He's a Jew, he's not a Jew. He's a nice guy, he's a bad guy. It doesn't matter. It's not relevant. What you heard now, it's true or not? It's true. Act on it. That's it. No, but, but that, how did this guy dare to tell me such a thing? What, does, what difference does it make who told you? You know you have to fix it? Yes. So does it make a difference if this person told you or that person? What difference does it make? You need to change. If someone that he likes told him, he's willing to consider if someone he doesn't like is not even open to listen, he blocked his mind. Sometimes you want to come to a secular person and prove to him the Torah is divine. If you have a long beard and a sombrero, no matter how much you talk, brilliant proof. From the minute you open your mouth, he blocked his heart and he blocked his mind. All he thinks about, God forbid that I would look like him. With such long beard and this kind of clothes and this tzitziot. And everywhere I'm going to go, people will tell me, what happened? You got, you, ishtagata? Itcharfanta? Who died? Someone died? That's how they react. So right away, you see the first impression, they get very scared. Why? They brainwash their head non-stop, non-stop. They're very nervous. Now I want to tell you something very interesting, and then we connect everything together. Uh, we know that the Gemara, in Masechet Brachot, page 63, the Gemara speaks about the Chachamim that sat in a vineyard in Yavne. Yavne, the Sanhedrin, the Chachamim, used to be in Bet HaMikdash, in Lishkat HaGazit. Then they, they saw that there are too many cases of execution coming to the court. And they did not want to execute any Jew as wicked as he was. 
So they said, how are we going to do something that will be legal according to the Torah and will make us not kill anyone? No execution in a court. Because we cannot do whatever we want. We have to follow Hashem's instructions. So they sit and sit and sit. How are we going to dismiss the executions? Because anyway, in the end, Hashem gives everyone what they deserve. So why should we be the executor? Let Hashem deal with them. And they came up with a brilliant idea. What's the idea? We have to keep the words of the Torah precisely. Of course, make no mistake, we do not learn Torah literally from the verses. We are not reform and we are not sdukim. The Torah is 1% written, 99% oral. We must have the, the, the written Torah, because based on the written Torah, we have all the oral laws. But without the oral laws, you do not understand one verse in the Torah. And you do not understand how to keep one of the 613 commandments. There's no explanation how to do it. There's no explanation how to do tefillin. You know what it means to do tefillin? You have a cow walking here now in the field. Let's call her Susie. Susie the cow. Rabbi Ruven and Rabbi Shimon looking at Susie. How many pairs of tefillin you think Susie will produce? <laughs> Let's have a bet. I say... 50 pairs. I go for 70. Tov, Suzy, yalla. Shechita, the meat goes to Shulchan Shabbat. Skins, remove the skin, get rid of the head, clean the inside. That's a big job. Everyone take his share. The butcher shop take what they take. Now you have skin with fair. You got to get rid of the fair. What do you have to do? You have to put them in lime. Lime, it's a white powder that makes it dry. Because the skin, remember, it's moisture. Because you just took it off the meat. Still full of moisture. So you put it in, and it absorbs in the skin, and becomes dry. Then you have to come with brushes. Everything has to be handmade. Takes the brush and remove all the air. Now you finally have pieces of leather. Now you send them to that filling place. I recommend you see a movie, how long it takes to make tefillin. Logically, if the goyim would have to make tefillin, it would be $20,000 a pair. If they sell a lousy Gucci bag for $6,000, which takes them probably an hour to make it with their machines, tefillin that takes a year to make, how much would it be? $600,000. Think about it. If they have a machine that makes some lousy bag and put a name, Gucci on it, whatever, who's Gucci, I don't know who's Gucci. How much? $6,000. Imagine how much, if they have to make the whole tefillin with hand. And if they would make my tefillin fully handmade without electric, probably it would be a million dollars. Based on labor in America. So... <laughs> It's a very long process. Now from this skin, they begin to make it a shape and they have to divide. Wow, what a job. And sometimes you mess up. You got to start all from the beginning. What a job, Rabotai. And then you have to make the parashiot. And then you have to make lines. And then you have to make the ink. It all has to be natural. And then they prepare the feather. And then it begins. Aleph. Mezuzah, 713 letters. But it's very, very slow. See how slow it is. Little by this. Aleph. Vav. This. Then dip it again. In like the old days. The cloth itself, it's $20 almost. Then to do tagim, a few dollars. To check with computer, a few dollars. It's expenses. If he rents a place, he has a lot of other expenses around. So it makes, before you even start riding, it could be sometimes $25, $30. Dollars. 
Then you walk three, four hours to make one beautiful mezuzah. He has to make money, the sofer. And the broker that brings it from country to country, he wants to add. And then he comes to the store, and the store doubles the price. That's why you go to a store here and you pay $300 for good mezuzah. But if you come directly to the sofer, you pay a third of it. Why? Because you don't have the broker, you don't have the store. The store is entitled to make money. What did they open such a nice place for? They have to make money, they pay taxes, they have employees. In the end, just like everything else in life. The dealer sell the car and they add their fee and this fine and that tax and this one. It grows up. Finally, Rabotai, where do you have all these laws of tefillin in a written Torah? You have more than a thousand steps and not one of them it's written in a written Torah. And if one you did wrong from the thousand, it's not kosher. One tiny mess up, and it's not kosher. Let's see inside. The tefillin of the head is divided to four sections. Between, what separates? You know, you have four different uh, parch- parchnips. Parchnips, how do you say? Parchments. Parchments, you stick it inside, you roll it, you tie it with the legament of the hair of the cow, and you stick it inside, one, two, three, four, four different parashiot from the Torah. But between, the separation is very skinny leather, very skinny, you know, like this uh, darbuka, bram, even skinnier. They have to heat it, to make it thin, and they have to sew it in such a way. If there is one tiny hole in one of them, it's still kosher. But if you're going to have two holes, it's not kosher. It's microscopic. If you don't know who you buy from, there is no way to ever find out that there are two holes, because once it's inside, there's no way to see. It's too narrow. Put light, you put magnified lights, you're not going to be able to tell. You have to know exactly who you buy, from the top professional or no. That's why in Filin, Hasidim pay six, seven thousand dollars a period, you know, to buy something good. Anyway, so if there are two tiny holes, everything else you did, superb, unbelievable, best leather, best quality, best sofer, best stripes, everything handmade, beautiful. One tiny hole of a needle, make the whole feeling like a piece of leather from your couch. Nothing. Pasul. Not only that, if you make bracha, you have a sin that you say the name of God in vain. Of course, that's if you knew. If you didn't know, it's not intentional sin, but it's still a sin. Not intentional, it's still a sin. So, Abotai, the Chachamim found a very clever way not to execute wicked people, not to execute Mechalelei Shabbat, murderers if they had any. The Torah say, Me'et Mizbachi Tikachenu Lamut. Once you finish the trial in Lishkat Gazit in Bet HaMikdash, and he was found guilty, directly from Lishkat Gazit from Bet HaMikdash, you take him to the execution place. Why the Torah say, directly from my altar, you take him to die? Because the Mizbeach of Bet HaMikdash, the big altar, was right next to Lishkat Gazit. So because Hashem did not say, you take him from Sanhedrin to die. You take him from the altar to die. Why did Hashem use this language? The, the proper language should have been, take him from the courtroom directly to the execution place. Why did Hashem change the language? Hashem is precise. Everything has a reason. That now there is a way around it. You separate between the courtroom and the altar to be in two different places. And you can never fulfill this verse. The verse is, take him from the altar into the execution. 
But now we move from Jerusalem to Yavne, far away. And over here we'll judge. Ah, so from here you cannot take him to die because there's no altar. So what's going to happen to all these criminals? Either we put them in jail, or we give them a fine, or we give them warning. But we won't kill anyone. Why? We don't want to start executing people. But they're going to go back on the street. That's Hashem's responsibility. If he wants to take a, a serial killer out of the street, he has any problem. The fact he didn't take him out yet, he has his reasons. It's not my problem. Maybe it is your problem. Maybe I expect you to clean the streets. The Torah says, Clean the bed from among you. Clean the bed from, bed from among me when it's possible. When now there are too many wicked people, it's not realistic. If today we had Sanhedrin, how many people would have to be executed? 12 million people, right away, within a week. Is it possible to do such thing? All the Mechalele Shabbat, all the gays, all the people who goes with married women, uh, all kinds of other terrible other things that people do. There's a list of things. The Torah gave that penalty. The court is going to sit all day and execute people? No. What are we going to do? Leave it to Hashem. So Rabotai, listen to this. So the Chachamim now sits in Yavne. Now you understand why they're in Yavne. In a nice vineyard. They sit over there, learn Torah, and judge cases. They praise the Torah. How wonderful the Torah is. And they say... Let's give proofs why the Torah is the greatest thing on earth. Nothing better than that. There was a person named Oved Edom Agiti. Remember this name. Oved. One time there was a war between Israel and the Philistines. The nation of Israel decided we're going to the war against these cruel Philistines. The Philistines were the nation of Goliath. The giant. They say, we are now going to a war. We have a very good amulet. Kamea. What's the Kamea? The Aaron Kodesh of Hashem. We take the Aaron with us. One time, they did it. And they lost. They're holding the... the Aaron of Hashem, and they lost. Why they lost? Because Hashem wanted to tell them, amulet is fine and it's important sometimes, but the actions are a million times more important. And if you think you're going to act wicked and you're going to put some kind of an amulet in your pocket or hold the Sefer Torah with you or put filin in your head and because of that you're going to win the war, you are dreaming. First, I check who you are. What do you do in hidden rooms? How do you speak? How do you conduct business? How you dress on the street, especially women? The Aaron will not help you. Not only will not help you, the Philistines stole the Aaron. Big tragedy. Philistines, this wicked Philistines, they took the Aaron of Hashem. There was a young guy. His name was No? What was his name? Shaul. From the tribe of Binyamin. Good, you're waking up. <laughs> Shaul from the tribe of Binyamin. That's bef way before he was a king. He's a soldier, a warrior. He ran to Goliath, that holding the Aaron, giant Goliath. Opened the Aaron quickly. Goliath is huge. Until he moved, Shaul opened the Aaron, stole what was inside the Aaron, the commandments, the Luchot. Took the Luchot and ran away. So the Philistines now have an empty Aaron. Empty Aaron. You see Aaron behind us? There are Sifre Torah inside. What makes the Aaron special? 
זה דורס. זה ספרי תורה. Once you take out the Torah, the Aaron is not so significant anymore, right? God forbid when they had sometimes fire, when they try to save this, the first thing they try to save is Sifre Torah. There's other things in the synagogue. That's not so critical. Right now, first the Sifre Torah. So, Shaul took the Luchot and ran. So the Philistines now have the empty Aaron, empty. And what happened? HaKadosh Baruch Hu began to punish the Philistines every day. Diseases, pandemic, all kinds of problems. The Philistines go crazy. What's going on? He's sick and he's sick and he died and he's... Wow! What happened to us? Rabotai, this is very evil, wicked goyim. They realize God of the Jews is punishing us. We're holding something that belongs to him. Send it back to them. How are you going to send them back? They are on the other side of the border. This is all around Gaza over there, Ashkelon in Israel. Those areas. What are we going to do? Tie it to a cow and let the cow run. Or an ox, whatever it was. And the cows begin to walk, walk, walk. And the carriage is carrying their own. The own arrived to which city? Which city the Americans love the most in Israel? After Jerusalem. <laughs> Bet Shemesh. It's all Americans, Ramad Bet Shemesh. Tens of thousands of Americans over there. Baruch Hashem. So, the Aaron arrived to Bet Shemesh. Who was the king at that time? Huh? Later, Shaul became the king. And later, David became the king. Now when David became the king on the nation of Israel, he sent to bring the Aaron from Bet Shemesh to Jerusalem. The Aaron was in Bet Shemesh. Empty Aaron, empty. It's time to bring it to Jerusalem. But he made a mistake. One critical mistake. Instead of carry the Aaron with the hands, like the Torah say, Bakatefisau, the Torah specifically say, you have to respect the Aaron that holds the commandments that I gave to the Jewish nation. So you don't send it with a taxi. Hey, Uber, I have something for you to deliver to Jerusalem. What? The Aaron of Hashem. Come on. Make, take people, righteous people, to carry the Aaron. And they walk with that to pay respect. They took it with a carriage. It's much easier. The horses go, the Aaron is on the back, until he gets to Jerusalem. One of the people that was in charge of moving the Aaron, his name was Uza. Uza. Ein, Zain, hey. Sometimes it's with Vav. Depend how you write it. Spell it with Ein as well. When David saw that... He said to stop the process of taking the Aaron to Jerusalem. Stop! And he was very, very upset that Uzzah died because of that. So David recalculated what to do now. Wow, what am I doing? What should I do? In the meantime, they don't know what to do. It's a big dilemma. He's afraid that other people will die and he doesn't want to upset Hashem. So there was a person, remember what I told you? What was his name? Oved Edom Agiti. He took the Aaron of Hashem to his house. Where was his house? Kiryat Yearim. Where is it now in Israel? Telstone. 
just before Jerusalem. So pay attention. From Ashkelon and Gaza, by the beach, he went to Bet Shemesh. From Bet Shemesh, he went up to Telstone, Kiryat Yarim. A little bit more, another 10 miles, he will go to Jerusalem. But that's probably where the tragedy happened. So now Uzzah took the Aaron to his house. Where does he live? Kiryat Yarim. When you go to Jerusalem, pay attention to the sign. You see, before you get to Yerushalayim, on the right side, next to Abu Ghosh, there is an Arab village, Abu Ghosh, right next to it, you see Kiryat Yarim. I gave a few lectures over there. Kiryat Yarim. They call it Telstone. So, he took it to his house. How many months the Aaron was in his house? While David is recalculating, how long? Three months. Very good. As a result of that, the house of Oved became so blessed. Hashem gave him all the blessings a human being can ask for. His wife and his eight daughter-in-laws gave birth to six babies in one shot. Just like the women in Egypt. Shisha bekeres echad. Miracle. Blessing that you can see right away. It's, it's not random. It's not coincidence. See the hand of Hashem. You have eight daughter-in-laws. Eight sons married to eight girls. All eight, six in one shot. Within months. He had 48 grandchildren. <laughs> Today he would say, wow, what a punishment Hashem gave me. How will I help so many grandchildren? Back then they knew to appreciate kids a little better. So now he has a very big blessing. And now why did I tell you all this story? Why I, I came to teach you history here? It wasn't my priority. What do we learn from this story? Listen carefully. The Gemara say, Ma Aaron shelo achal veshata? What the Aaron? That is raw material, doesn't eat, doesn't drink. You don't have to serve the Aaron. You have to, don't have to make a bed for him. You don't have to bring water to wash his, his body. Just the raw material was in front of of the, in the house of Uza, and he was only sweeping around and washing around and nothing else. Didn't have to feed the Aaron every day. Didn't have to take care of his shower. Nothing. If you host a righteous Talmud Chacham in your house and you feed him and you give him drinks and you give him money, Needless to say, how many blessings will come to your life? Do you understand the needless to say? Aaron is a piece of raw material. It's in my house? Wow, unlimited blessing. If you have big hacham come, one week is by your house, two weeks. Run. Supermarket, what do you like, Rabbi? What bread? What this? Anything special? Ma, you like beer? Cold beer? Something? Maybe we, no, no. Whiskey a little bit? No, no. What can I do for you? You eat this kind of meat, that one, I eat this kashrut. Okay, we usually buy from there, but for you I drive another half an hour. I got it from there, no problem. What else? I have stain on my suit. Can you? No, don't worry. Bring the suit. Here is in the meantime. Let me go. I'm coming back. No, no, I have to go to work. The heck with work. Forget about work. No, I feel comf I don't feel good, comfortable. You lose money in the business. Forget the business. Close the business for a week. I'm now at your service. Why? Because you have beautiful eyes? Because you have a nice sombrero or what? Why? why, why what's the whole concept here? I do, I do nothing for him. I see in my eyes only one thing. What makes Hashem pleased? What makes him happy? 
Uzzah was sweeping around the Aaron, making sure the Aaron is safe. And Hashem was so pleased and gave him all the blessing. To entertain a rabbi or any Talmud Chacham in your house, take care of his needs. Ah, it's much harder than a Aaron. And who is more important, the Aaron or someone that learned 30, 40, 50 years of Torah all his life and became a walking Sefer Torah? Some fools, when they take out the Sefer Torah on Shabbat, they rise, you know, half an hour. <laughs> when they see Talmud Chacham, look how he dresses. Rabbi, can I buy you suits in the outlet? Why? I don't understand. You care about the individual. You care about the Torah. Do you know what's the difference between this generation and the previous generation? The previous generation kissed the Torah with the mouth and gave tzedakah with the hand. This generation kissed the Torah with the hand and gave tzedakah with the mouth. Meaning only with the mouth. Promises! Whoa, I have a list of promises. If 1% of the promises I got in the last 27 years would materialize, we would have probably a few more tens of thousands of Baalit Shuva today. 1%. I will and will do and we have a plan. Give us another three more weeks. It's happening. Don't worry. It's a done deal. It's not if. It's just when. <laughs> so, no, it is what it is. What can you do? <sighs> That's the concept of Issachar and Zvulun. Issachar sits and learns Torah, and Zvulun pay all the bills. Someone who's machzik talmide chachamim, his merit is endless. One rich guy, businessman, used to sponsor Slovotka Yeshiva, one of the best yeshiva of all time. Lots of musar and ethics came out of that yeshiva, and lots of holy Talmidei Chachamim. So, one time they made a lunch, special lunch, and who was the rabbi over there? Rav Cheskel Abramsky, Zatzal. One of Gdolei Ador. And they invited that rich guy. They say, why don't you come to the speech of Rav Avramsky, and after that you join us to the lunch. Special lunch. You know, respecting you. He came. He came. He sits now, and Rav Cheskel begins to talk words of Gemara. Explain the Rishonim, Shittat Rashi, Shittat Dis, Tosfot, everything. The rich man, he knows how to make money and to build buildings. He doesn't exactly understand Gemara, especially when it goes so deep. So he sits over there and look at them like this is a bunch of Chinese people talking. He's bored. You know how it is. Rich, but ignorant. Tov, he sits over there <laughs> one hour. He's starting to look at his watch, look around. What am I doing here? He's asking himself. And the Bachurei Shiva are in heaven. They're full of fire. And the rich guy is looking around. What's going on over here? I'm the only one who suffers here. He's about to choke. He said to the guy next to him, excuse me, how long do you think the rabbi will continue to talk? <laughs> Meaning, how long this nightmare will go on? <laughs> and the Bachur said, oh... He loves to talk. It's going to be very long. Wow. The rich guy. Tov. Open up his tie. Open his cufflinks. Fold his sleeves. Look around. <laughs> now, finally the shiur finished. Now they do the lunch. They give him good, nice food. This, that. Everyone thank him how great he is. And thanks to him they learn Torah. So he is what? Issachar or Zvulun? He is the Zvulun, the sponsor. 
is Sachar, is the Bachurim, that learns Torah, he sponsored them. What is the deal in Shamaim? Everything they learn, count like he learned. So they learn now four months straight until summer break, Ben Azmanim. Four months, 50 Bachurim from morning to night. Billions of mitzvot. All go to Uncle Sam's account. Jimmy the American Jew. If you ask Jimmy, you are so rich in Torah. You have billions of mitzvot in your file of the highest level of Torah in Slovotka. You're such a giant chacham. You're probably even greater than Rashi already with so much Torah you gain. There's 50 guys working for you. He sa- the, the rich man say, excuse me, off the record, if you show me how to read Rashi, I don't know. I get confused. Between the lace, the lamed, the tzadi, I'm getting confused. So now I want to ask you a question. When this rich man will die, what are they going to do with him in heaven? In heaven, you have unlimited levels of yeshivot of Torah. And over there, there's no obstacle. The neshama enjoy the greatness of God to the highest level. Without fatigue, without laziness, without body ache, without headache, without worry about parnasah and your wife and your children and your enemies and the neighbors and the government and the army and the Arabs. None of that exists. Unlimited money you have, everything you need is you have, no one is sick, there's no hospitals, there's no more sicknesses, there's no more Arabs to murder us, nothing. Ideal world. And you enjoy and enjoy and enjoy and you gain and you gain with no limitation and no forgetfulness. There's no problem with concentrations. The brain over there doesn't exist. It's the pure soul without the brain, without the head, without the stomach, without all the headache. He has Crohn disease, half of the days in the bathroom. You don't have all this. Pure, directly to the neshama. Do you know what pleasure it is? I know some of you who doesn't like to learn Torah in this world are wondering right now, what is this rabbi is selling us? <laughs> we do everything we can to run away from learning. That's over here. Because over here you have other nonsense that the Satan pushed to your head. Soccer game, NBA game, big business, trip to Miami, that, wedding, birthday party, Kafkazi party, Bukhari party, Persian, Syrian. Ashkenazi, everyone with his preferences. But over there, you don't have all this. You are a full addict to the Torah. You can't live a second without it. And it's just growing. It's like a snowball. Every day becomes greater than yesterday. And greater, and greater, and greater. Okay, now you took this rich guy from New York. Tycoon in investment. He comes to the next world. He has a very high level, but he doesn't understand any Torah. He's going to be now with Rashi, Rambam. Rambam will say something. We'll sit over there. Don't there is some buildings over here to buy, to renovate? <laughs> <laughs> what am I doing here? No, maybe restaurant, Chinese restaurant here. Huh? Do you understand the, the problem that we have over here or no? So what's going to be with this rich man? The answer, Hashem, download all the Torah of all the people that he sponsored into his neshama express for free. He is now a big giant chacham in Olam Even though he barely learned half an hour a day because he was busy with making money. Sins, he has to do tshuva. Not just because you learn Torah, you're allowed to, do, to commit sins. No. You have to fix the sins. But obviously, the Torah is the greatest way to make a person a tzaddik. No better way. 
So רבותיי, listen carefully now. Carefully, but carefully. מצריתן, בצל החוכמה, בצל הכסף. Where is it written? Kohelet, chapter 7, verse 12. What is the meaning of this verse? Under the wisdom, under the money. Meaning, in this world, it's divided to two different categories. Money separately and Torah separately. But once you go there, Shem combined like two sukkahs into one. And all the Torah comes into 100% into your soul and you have control on everything that people learn thanks to you. Now, Rav Chaim Ivolojin, the student of the Gaon Mivilna over 200 years ago. He was the rabbi that the Russian came and his tame and told him you have to teach Russian in yeshiva. Just like they do here in New York. They want you to teach the kids English and history and who knows what else. Math. Why? Because some yeshivot, especially Hasidim, they don't want any American influence. Definitely they don't want secular study in the same class when you learn the holy Torah of God. Don't mix Chol and Kodesh. So what happened? The city starting to bully them. You want assistance? We have Board of Education. We help schools. We help education. We are not racist. We help the blacks. We help the Chinese. We want to help the religious Jews. But we have conditions. We give money. You will teach what we tell you. Just like in the synagogue. I sponsor the shul. Rabbi, make sure you do what I tell you. Buy from here, don't buy from there. Don't give this guy aliyah, make sure you give this guy aliyah. But it's Mechalel Shabbat, close your eyes. Don't get me angry. I just gave you $30,000 yesterday, no? Please, Rabbi, don't be ungrateful. Wait, you are the sponsor, I am the spiritual leader. We can compromise. Here in Israel, they try to compromise now. That's what's going on. So over there, Rabotai, they came to Rav Chaim Ivolojin and they say, if you're not going to teach Russian, we'll close your yeshiva. And he said, I'm not going to surrender to you. And they closed the yeshiva. And how many yeshivot opened thanks to that? Ten. Every big chacham went to a different place and opened a yeshiva. That's why they call Rav Chaim Ivolojin Avi HaYeshivot, the father of yeshivas, plural. Why? Thanks to him being zealous to Hashem and not surrendering to the Russian wicked communist. Thanks to that we got instead of one yeshiva, ten. Or maybe more by now. So, Rav Chaim Ivolojin one of the supporters of his yeshiva passed away. Before he passed, he asked Rav Chaim to learn Mishnayes for his neshama. Mishnayot, to learn Mishnah, to elevate his soul. Rav Chaim, of course, kept his promise and was learning Mishnayot for that wealthy supporter. But he learns deep. Until he came to one Mishnah and he got stuck. He had a big question and he didn't know the answer. Then he fell asleep at night. Shortly after he fell asleep, who came to him in a dream? That rich man. And told him the answer to his question in this Mishnah. Even though when he was alive he didn't know anything. He didn't even know how to open the Mishnayot. And Rav Chaim Ivolojin say, who told me the secret of this Mishnah? The person that sponsored the yeshiva. He went up to Shamaim, and here is the proof of what the Gemara said. That the Zvulun get full, full position. He owns all the Torah that people learn thanks to his money.
which is an also logically makes a lot of sense. So here you go, Rabotai. So don't eat your heart too much. Some, some uh, wealthy people, they came to big rabbis and said, listen, I'm tired of working. I have enough money. I want to retire. And the uh, rabbi said, no, I want to go full time to yeshiva. I barely learn an hour a day. I want to sit all day and learn. I have enough money. I don't need to worry. You're not allowed. You have to continue to work. Why? Since when a rabbi tell a person, don't come to yeshiva? Unless if he's a liberal. <laughs> For him, it's better he'll go to university. But a real kosher rabbi, when someone come and ask him, Rabbi, what do you think I should do? Should go to college or should go to a good yeshiva? What is the question? Is there any dilemma here? But what with Parnassah? Again this question? Again this heresy? Again, where is the minimum amount of faith that Hashem fed us for 40 years in the desert without education, without college degrees, without hard work, first shift, second shift, night shift, 40 years, 3 million people ate and survived. It's a fact. Even the Goim admit. Can you feed 3 million people in the middle of nowhere? Without education? <laughs> ah, what do you think? Okay, let's say who has a master degree. Come, I'll give you a piece of bread today. Hashem, we never went to college. Okay, so you didn't go to college, so I'll starve you to death. Make sense? Only by heretics. Heretics think the more I'm going to go against Hashem's will, the more he's going to give me money. The more I will go with his command, the less he's going to give me good. Righteous person, leave the stupid university logic aside and come to only one conclusion. It can never be that I would listen to Hashem and make him happy and give up all kinds of opportunities to make money by gaining a degree and finding a job in finance and who knows what. It cannot be that I'm going to give it up even though I have connection and they offer me a, a job and they give me a, some kind of a scholarship, whatever. And I went to learn full-time Torah, 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 Torah. And because I learned for five, ten years Torah, Hashem prepared a long, long knife and stuck it in my back. Ay, Hashem, why are you doing this to me? How dare you not going to the Sodom and Gomorrah college and instead you went to the Holy Yeshiva? How dare you? Why, Hashem, I thought you'll be happy. What about Parnassa? <laughs> I was counting on you. Don't worry, I was just joking. <laughs> You're good. You think he's going to make less than someone else? Just today I got a call on the way here about someone I made Val Chuv a few years ago. And he went to medical school. And what is what he's about to do now? To marry a Spanish Goya. That's how everyone ends almost in college. Remember what I said before about the Israeli army? 5% stay religious. 95% become completely secular. And some anti-religion. Not just secular. Anti. To justify that they left Hashem and the Torah. In college... A thousand times worse than the Israeli army. Thousand times worse. Imagine five years sitting with all this not modest goyot over there. All day like this. Imagine look at all the gays around you. Imagine listening to all their curses five years from morning to night. Look at their lousy faces full of impurity. Look at the pork they eat in front of you. Look at all the lies and the deceiving and the politician and the lefty liberal agenda. Look at the gay parades. Look at the horrible things. Look at the movies they put over there. Look at the heresy they teach over there. And in the end, Baruch Hashem, you're going to make 60,000 a year because you have a degree. And Roman, the immigrant from Uzbekistan, already make more than you first month is in America. 
driving an Uber. <laughs> but you are educated. We'll give you that. You are educated. Maybe one day you match your salary to Roman from Uzbekistan or Isik from, you know, Ashdod. Maybe. And if you will, wow, wow. We are so impressed. You have an extra $50,000 saving because you are educated. Wow, fantastic. But you have no lama ba, you fool. You sold your eternity for a nice house, for a boat in a marina. But you don't have olam ba. That's what they forget to tell you. We want you to be educated. Do you have a professional for me, Rabbi? No. I have a bachur yeshiva, but he's better than professional. Why? His father is one of the richest Jews in the world. So you're going to have everything. You're going to have a big house, five maids, three cars, an unlimited credit card. So you worry about professional? I'm sorry. I want professional. I want professional. Between me and you, if you take the liberal Jews here in Manhattan, and you tell her I have twin brothers, both of them are very good looking. Same face. Man, same face. Two Jews. One does not have any college education, make three million dollars a year. It's real estate, buying, selling. The other one, very educated dentist. Make a hundred thousand a year. Who is she going to take? The not educated three million dollar a year? Or the one that looks exactly the same, but is a doctor? Dr. Cohen! <laughs> uh, Mr. Cohen, excuse me, Dr. Cohen. <laughs> no, she wants professional. I seen it. No, I'm not joking. She wants the professional. Why? Because that's what they brainwashed her. The rotten society that she lives in, they told her, if you're not educated, we don't want you. Educated with what? With the dumbest thing on earth. With what? Joe Biden is also educated. Hussein Obama is also educated. Every decision of his life is worse than a dog. A dog is smarter than them. Mary met with men, helping people to change their sex, helping Iran to destroy the world, going against Israel. What is this? Destroying the world, destroying America. George Soros is also educated. Look what he did to the world. Very educated Jew. What did he do? He destroyed the world. The two people in our generation that made the biggest damage to the world are Hussein Obama and George Soros in Machshimam. Those two made a damage to the world that cannot be reversed. Cannot be reversed. But they're very educated. In Israel, all these people who scream every Motsi Shabbos in Tel Aviv, a lot of them are big doctors. What do they want? They want Israel to be given to the Hamas, that they will slaughter their children. They're very educated. They do everything they can to help Ahmed and Mustafa to come and kill us. They beg them, Ahmed, please help me, I'm helping you, that you can come and slaughter me. Educated, but dumber than a shoe. You go to the Machane Uda in Jerusalem, you see the people that sell tomatoes. They didn't finish eighth grade, some of them. They already went to work with their father in the vegetables. Ask them ideological question. What's right and what's wrong? The guy from Machane Yehuda who barely know how to spell, he will answer much, much more accurate in the eyes of God than this professor. I put my life on it. So what do we see? The more sophisticated and educated and academic you are, the more wicked you are. And dumber. Dumb doesn't mean you don't know math. Maybe you're genius in math. Maybe you're genius in computer. Maybe you know the whole history of the world. No contradiction. Dumb means you make all the wrong choices in your life. Look at your marriage. Look at your children. Look at everything in your life. Look where you donate your money to. 
How many Jews gave more than a hundred million dollar donations to places that destroyed the world? To places that they teach that we came from the monkeys. To all kinds of funds that are very anti-Semite against their own people. How many? Look at Mark Zuckerberg. He gave hundreds of millions of dollars so far to charity in the last 20 years since he became a billionaire. Not one dollar went to a good cause. Everything went to places that make Hashem furious. Not one dollar went to a good cause. Same thing George Soros and many other Jews I know. They will put millions of the generous. They like the Jews in general. They like to give donations but to the wrong places. Why? When you don't have Torah, when you don't have a rabbi, that's what's going to happen. What do you think? And plus, you eat non-kosher food. You expect your brain to function. The Torah says, when you eat non-kosher food, you become metumtam. Rashi explained, what does it mean, metumtam? Your neshama become impure. The blood that is being created with your, in your body from the food you eat, the food is illegal. It's not legal to put it in your system. You're rebelling against God by eating cheeseburger, by eating pork, by eating shrimps, and all the rest of the non-kosher food. It creates impure blood, contaminates your entire spirituality, and every time you see a question, ideological question, you always support the evil and you will go against the righteous. Always. That's why all these academic are pro-gay marriage, are pro-taking children and changing their gender, even though they don't even know anything about life. They are pro, they are pro-abortion, murdering babies just because their parents didn't plan to bring them to the world. So they're going to chop them with knives. And how many of them were Nazis putting babies in the oven and say, Duncan Shen. They, ne they never forgot to say thank you. Oh, Hans. Oh, Duncan Shen, I forgot yesterday to tell you. Duncan Shen for what? That you gave me that little baby Jew to throw into the fire. Forgot to say thank you. And they did it while they're listening to Mozart and Beethoven. Um, pam, pa, pam. Ah, na, 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 na. Whoops. Another innocent baby into the gas. Educated. They were very educated. Some of them were great musicians, great engineers, Mercedes, BMW, Volkswagen. They all participating in murdering babies. And then what, do you, what did the Jews do? Fight to give them business. German are good products. Those German butchered your grandfather, you idiot. Oh, I'm not Ashkenazi, I'm Sfaradi. Oh, so it, that, so it makes a difference, huh? They murder a grandfather of your neighbor, another Jew, but not your grandfather because you came from Iran or I don't know from where. So, oh, that's okay. You see how dumb we are? So in reality, <laughs> it is what it is. That's the situation. There are so many things we don't think about. How many of you thought... Today, when you came here today, that this lawyer in a film that, that circulates in Israel is the hero of the moment. How many of you? Everyone. I think I was the only one that was thinking about how wicked he is. Why? Because he's a criminal lawyer. And he walked in Tel Aviv prosecuting people against the laws of God. I said to one of my students, Yesterday I said to him, after many years that we've been speaking on and off, I'm giving up on you, officially. He said, why? It's fully religious. Fully religious. I said, because your ideology, it seems to me that it will never become proper. Your ideology is messed up. Your ashkafa. Why? I said to him, when we have a dilemma between a righty and a lefty, a lefty is a liberal Jew, hate Torah, hate Hashem, hate everything. The righty doesn't hate religion. It's not religious. Both of them are Mechalel Shabbat. 
both of them don't put filin, both of them don't eat kosher, but one is very strong right wing, and the other one is very strong left wing. Who do we like more? If you're religious, you must like the righty much more than the lefty. But when they both die, where do they go, both of them? Express to hell or to kafakela. Why? But one was a, a very, very big supporter of religion. He loved Judaism. He fight anti-Semitism. He fight the lefty liberals. He voted for Trump. You want to get rid of the lefty agenda. He gives beautiful speeches about how wonderful the Jewish religion is. But he doesn't keep anything. And when they both died, where did they go? Expressed to hell, and both of them have no share to the world to come. Both of them are, are 100% wicked. Of course, this one is much better than this one. There's nothing to compare. But reality, according to the book of law, both of them, Mechalel Shabbat, and Mechalel Shabbat has no share to the world to come. Even if we love rabbis, even if he loves Gemara, even if he loves Israel, even if he hates Hamas terrorists, even if he's anti-abortion, even hundreds of other things that are all positive. It's Mechalel Shabbat and Lo Olam Abba, with no exception to the rule. Never in the history a Mechalel Shabbat made it to heaven and will never make it to heaven. If he did tshuva before he died and became Shomer Shabbat, he has a chance. We have to see what is other crimes. But it's a pasuk in the Torah 12 times. You think Hashem is a liar? That soul will be cut permanently from the afterlife. So what do we do for these people? If your father died and he wasn't Shomer Shabbat, or the mother, or brother, sister, son, what can we do? We say Kaddish. We sponsor lectures like now that inspire people to become better. We spread it all over and more people become religious and closer and closer. It helps the soul. And we have to hope that thanks to all the things we do for that soul, Hashem will go easy on the punishment or will send them back in another reincarnation to get another chance. Because after all the reincarnation, if a person is still Mechalel Shabbat, it's over. That's it. He also won't have a shelter to the world to come. Even if he sponsor all the Torah in the world, if he's Mechalel Shabbat, and lo chelek la'olam haba. Mechalel Shabbat areu kegoy lechol davar. Not only that, if you see what the big Talmidei Chachamim, the Kabbalists say about it, that if you take money from certain people, not only it doesn't count as mitzvah, that all the mitzvot that are done with their filthy money goes to the Satan, go to the Sitracha. <laughs> I don't want to confuse you too much, but it's going a lot deeper than what you imagine. Baba Sali wouldn't take money from everyone. Some Rashi Shivot separate the money. Shomrei Shabbat, Mechalelei Shabbat. With the Shomrei Shabbat, the sponsor Torah. The rest, they clean the yeshiva, clean the bathroom, replace the light bulbs, fixing all kinds of uh, things, painting, whatever they need to do. Yeshiva have maintenance. They separate. Who say you're allowed to take from the Israeli government? Some say you're not allowed. Oh, so I'll tell you why. When we take money from the government, we do not take it from the government. We take it from our brothers and sisters. The gov government is only the collector. It takes from Reuven, the Jew, and give it to Shimon, the Jew. I'll explain. All Jews pay taxes, right? Let's talk about Israel. All religious Jews, the world, pay taxes. All religious people pay sales tax. Everything you buy in a store in Israel, you pay 18% tax. You buy a house to your son, you pay 10% tax right away. If it's a million dollar house in Bet Shemesh, 
$100,000 goes to the government from the sale. Everything you buy, they collect 18% the government. Everything. There's almost no exclusions. If you have income, you pay 40, sometimes 45% income tax. There's a lot of religious diamond dealers, a lot of religious real estate tycoons, a lot of other religious, very, very wealthy people that money in their families for generations already, bankers and all kinds of people like that. They pay millions of dollars, each one of them, in taxes. All the taxes that are collected from the Shomrei Shabbat in Israel are billions of dollars every year, together. This money, a very small portion of it, go to the yeshivot. We don't take money from the Mechalelei Shabbat, from the lefty Libras who bark in the street against us. We don't want to look at their lousy face. We're not even allowed to take money from them. Why should we give them power? To destroy us faster? I should help people that want to kill me, that they should kill me faster? So why we take from the government? Because the government forces us to give them money. And they take too much money. Forget about all the corruption and how much they steal. I'm not even getting there. So whatever they take, thank you, we'll give you 10% back. You know what it's like? Protection. You know protection? I'll tell you what it's like. You have the Arab murderers in Israel, all over. They come to your business. Hi. Shalom. Ani Rafi. What's his real name? Rafik. My brother is Rami. What's his real name? Huh? <laughs> Kitsu Rabotai, Yusuf become Yossi. They come. We are your new partner. Every Sunday we will come and you're going to give us 10% or 20% from the income of the business. You show us in a cash register how much you made and you're going to give us 10 or 20%, depending how greedy they are. And in return, if you ever have a problem with anyone, we will protect you. We're selling you insurance. No, no, I'm okay. Thank you. Thank you, Rami. Thank you, Yossi. Thank you, Rafi. No problem. I manage. No, no, you didn't understand. We're not asking if you're interested. We are informing you. Almost every business in Israel pay protection. Almost everyone, all over. There are 20 Arab families, each one of them have hundreds of soldiers. Like a mafia group multiplied by 20 known family, and they go from business to business. And if you refuse to pay, if you have buses, the next day 12 buses are on fire. Or your house is on fire. Or your child disappears for all day. And they send you a message, hi, remember me? Is, did your son come back home? What? Do you have my son? Don't worry, your son is already home. We will come Sunday for our package. No cops. The cops work for them. They, they take the cops and they give them money. The cops help them. If finally there is a, somebody wants to press charges against them, the cop makes it go. It works for them. He gets money. That's how it goes, a corrupted place without Torah, that's it, it's Sodom and Gomorrah. That's reality. You hear over here what you probably never dreamed that you're ever going to hear. But that's the reality. I hear it from inside, from people who are victimized by this. That's what they do. So what do they do? They take from you 20,000 shekel, and one day if you have a problem with someone, you call them, and they come and say, don't worry, we took care of it. That's exactly the Israeli government. They're going to take from you 18% from everything you buy. They're going to take 10% when you buy a house. They're going to take 45% from your income tax. And in the end, they're going to give you back less than 1% of what they charge and drink your blood. Call you parasite, useless, go to work. Why we have to give you money? That's what they do. To know the truth. Not only that, after you get 1% from the 100 you pay, 
meaning as a group, as religious people, you also give them service. Yad Sara, Yad Lea, they need wheelchair, come to the Haredim. They need uh, cribs, come to the Haredim. Someone is cancer patient, come to the Haredim. Someone needs a special surgeon somewhere in the world, come to Rafirer. Someone just got exploded in a terror attack. The Haredim will clean it up. Zaka, quickly, pick up the head. You need a funeral. The Haredim. You need to get married. The Haredim. You need filin. Shefer Torah for your parents. The Haredim. Haredim are their servants. They do everything for them. And what do they get in return? Every second a knife to the heart and to the back. And they give you 1% from the 100% they steal from you. And they blame you for being a blood sucker sucking our blood on prime television. The host, she say, until when they will suck our blood? Just like Nazi Germany. This is right now the situation in Israel. The good news is soon it's going to be all over. When the Mashiach come, every one of them will get exactly what they deserve. We don't have patience. We want to see it already. But we're going to need to have more patience. I want to finish. The best investment, to conclude what I just told you, from any other investment in the world is investing in the Torah. But if you have a choice to be Issachar or to be Zvulun, what's better? Issachar is better. You may ask, I don't get it, it's a contradiction. You told me, Rabbi, to stay to work because I sponsor a hundred Avrechim. You told me, no, no, don't come to learn full time. Stay to work. We need your money. If you quit, the yeshiva will close down. But you teach in your lesson that it's better to be an Avrech in yeshiva to learn than to sponsor. Make up your mind, Right? If you tell me you're very important, thanks to you, 100 people learn, and you get the reward for all 100, that means every day for the sponsor, it's like a 100 day for the Avrech in Yeshiva. Right or wrong? So what's better? To make what you make in 100 days or in one day? What's a better investment? So we're not only talking here about the profit. We're talking about your internal holiness. You will never be in the same level when you just give money, 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 but you don't learn. You're not fully in Torah. When you're fully in Torah, everything in your life changes. The way you behave to your wife, the way you behave to your children, the way you talk to people, the, the, the stress, the, the worry, it's all gone. You have a peace of mind. You're peaceful. You smile all day. The light of Hashem is on you. Just like we learned in a series, uh, Way of Hashem, I just finished recently. You're in heaven in this world. The happiness that comes from the neshama of learning Torah is words cannot describe it. You don't care about clothes and you don't care about cars and you don't care about the size of the house and the peeling wall. None of that exists by you. You have a full-time peace of mind. And you're full of fire of Torah. Something like this, you can never buy with money. Even if you have a thousand people learning for you, and yes, you're going to learn all the Torah eventually. But right now, you are nothing by a modern liberal. Maybe not a lefty liberal, but you're still modern. Yeah, Rabbi, I'm a businessman. That's why you don't know halachot. That's why you watch all your stupid shows. That's why you are addicted to sport. And that's why you care about your watch and your car and you replace it every two months because you are empty from inside. You're lying to yourself. You know you live in a lie, but you take drugs to make you forget, to make you comfortably numb. That's what you are, comfortably numb. Lying to the whole world and mainly to yourself. You don't have the guts to sit in front of the mirror and present yourself to yourself. Hi, nice to meet you. Let's, say, let's tell me who you are. 
make a list who you are, lazy bum, don't wake up in the morning, miss Kriyat Shema, cheap, you give something to someone, it burns your heart, instead of being happy, even when you support Torah, you don't sleep at night, why, why are you so angry, because you just give tzedakah, in food, everything you see right away, you push to your mouth, if later on, I hope it's going to be a, a kosher, why don't you check before, I want to swallow the table, you're talking to me about going to check. You know how far the kitchen is? The mashgiach, you know, until I find him on the phone? That's why it's all by you. It's a show. It's a show how you're going to get married. It's a show how the house is going to be. It's a show what car you drive. It's a show that the watch. I went today to a place, to Simcha, before I came here. I saw over a hundred Israelis that are here for at least 20, 30, 40 years. Heavy, loaded with money, spiritual level below zero. Every one of them have this ugly big hundred thousand dollars watches. Every one of them had this Rolls Royce, Bentley, BMW, Mercedes. You Israeli, you know the level of the people. You see the way they are, you see the women with all the injection and all the horrible clothes. If you wouldn't know she's a very rich woman, you would think she works. I don't want to tell you where. And some of them think they're religious. That's the biggest shock. Some of them actually think they're religious, full of jewelry, like some goyim, I don't know where, where they got this culture from. The language, this, this, I, got, I got shocked from what I've seen. Then you see few rabbis. You look at the rabbis and you look at the people. And you see the difference in the spiritual level is not ten times more or a hundred times more or a thousand. We're talking billions, billions. The level is billion times higher. The chacham compared to these people. And maybe some of these people have good heart and they give a lot of money to charity. Maybe, I don't know. We're not here to judge anyone. But what are their spiritual levels? Zero. Zero. Besides making a lot of money here in America and living the American stupid dream, they have zero, nothing, no progress in their entire life. You can see. Even when you start a conversation, I spoke to one of two of them. When you, you are, you're wondering to yourself, Hashem, why are you punishing me today? You don't find one thing in mutual to talk to them. It's like speaking to a little child, two years old, and expect him to understand Gemara and Musar and Ashkafa. That's, they gave up everything just for the success, for, for the materialistic success, for the boat, for the house, for another house, for another this, for that, achieving, opening, growing. Everyone come, flash his watch. It's like a zoo. When you come from a world of Torah and you see the complete different world, complete. I remember in the in the wedding of my son, it was an ordinary wedding, very very simple, down to earth, nothing flashy, Lakewood, era Torah. One billionaire was there, came to me, say. It's the best wedding I participated in my life. I've been in weddings that cost more than a million dollars. I never saw such a pure, holy happiness. Forgive me that I brought my father and mother. I already knew what to expect. I wanted them to see the difference between an average million dollar Bukharian wedding that they go to, many of them, or half a million dollars, to a very simple down-to-earth wedding with all the happiness and the kedusha, And then his father, he had to see how he was proud to take pictures with the religious people. They realized. The guy told me, no, no gas. told me, there's no, nothing can buy something like this. I tell people, let's change our habits. Let's stop with this show of stupidity. Let's stop with two hundred thousand. Stop with two hundred thousand dollars to burn on flowers when so many bachurei shiva don't have what to eat. How do we dare to do the things we do? 
How do we dare to spend three, four hundred thousand dollars on a car? What for? A fifty thousand dollars car doesn't drive from here to Zimbabwe back and forth. It will do the job, and it's pretty comfortable. Why do you need the best in the world? Why you need a fifty thousand uh, square feet house? Five, six thousand? It's not big enough. Ten thousand? Wow, it's still a palace. No, no, not enough. Need a two hundred million dollar home. And what's going to happen with that? There is one like this in Kesaria in Israel, prettiest house in the world. You have to see. They can't even sell it. It's time. They spend $30,000 a month to maintain it with all the workers. Looks like a palace. The person that built it, what did he do over there? Slept on a bed. No. When you sleep, you enjoy the palace you're in? When you snore now, do you care if you snore on a $1,000 bed or a $100,000 bed? Do you care if your room worth $10,000 or $300,000? Does it make a difference? Shtuyot. Look, you have to see how much time they put into it. One person told me, it took me 10 years to build this home. 10 years. You know how much time you have to put into it? Designer, architect, this, going... Choosing color, choosing tile, choosing marble, calling Italy, calling. Your entire life, go to this stupid house and in the end you're going to be punished for every dollar you burn there. Not only you didn't enjoy it in this world, not only so much Ainara came on you and destroyed your entire family and your children will kill each other after you die for the money. When you come in front of Hashem, only then the punishment will begin. I always encourage people to remember the words of Oscar Schindler. Remember him? The guy that saved the Jews in the Holocaust? They have a, a movie, Schindler's List. I watched it 30 years ago. I remember one minute from that film. Besides that it was horrible Holocaust scenes and very depressing and scary. But I remember a moment that he was walking in the end when all the survivor Jews standing over there, and he started to scream, why did I need this watch? There will be another 10 Jews. Why did I keep this? This would be another 50 Jews. And this car will be another 100 Jews. And this will be another 10 Jews. Meaning life, saving life. That's a goy. In the end, he did cheshbon nefesh. I haven't done enough. I could have saved another 1,000 Jews from burning. For that stupid Swiss watch that I kept. For that extra car that I could get rid of. From this uh, statue that I had. Some art uh, painting or something. When these billionaires will come to Shamaim and, and Hashem will show them how much they spend on art. $100 million on a statue. $30 million on a painting. And then the Hashem will show them how many rabbis over the years begged them to help the yeshiva and how they did not want to help ever. But they were very generous in the auction. 10 million, 12, 15. He goes with millions like it's quarters. But then when the rabbi come and said the yeshiva is in a $7 million debt, we have 7,000 students, the big yeshiva. We are in a deficit of 7 million. In the auction, in a second, it would raise by 7 million. In a second. And of 7 million, you expect me to pay it? I'll be very generous, I'll give you $18,000. If you wouldn't know what is it about, you heard that Mr. X gave the Rosh Yeshiva $18,000 check, you'll be so impressed, wow. But after you see how he burns money on his stupid painting, Catch up on canvas, a hundred million dollars. <laughs> a stupid naked woman statue, two million dollars. To be in a field, in a backyard. I remember I met one woman religious from my first film, Informatia Elokit, Israeli woman. She was taking care of a boy and a girl of one of the richest families in the world. They own the biggest chemical company in the world. The biggest. Own 100% without stockholders. Imagine how rich they are. So <laughs> she told me, when the old man was still alive, she told me, you have to see, I walk here, 
he has a house in, I don't know, Salem, Salem, somewhere, I don't know where it is. Salem, Salem. She told me it takes 20 minutes to walk from one side to the other. You have to walk and walk and it doesn't end. But while you're walking on the driveway, you have statues. A lot of ugly statues. And she said that one of the people that worked there told her that each statue he paid more than two million dollars. And there are dozens like them. Rain falls on it. No one looks at it. Two million. Two million. Two million. Two million. I make right now 50,000 ballet tshuva. Two million dollars. For every one of these stupid statues. And what happened to that old man? He had a, masha, a Chinese masseuse. Woman from China. Married her and she took almost all. All, almost all his money. Chinese woman from Shanghai, I don't know, she came. She was giving massage. Tricked him, and in the end she took everything. Or most of everything. You understand what happened to these people? And now the hell begin. They will curse the moment that they got all these billions. Why? We, we, sometimes we are jealous with these people. It's about time you realize their life is the worst you can imagine. Why? Because there is a price for this kind of life. They will get the bill. So far they didn't get the bill. When you go to a restaurant, you think ten times before what you order. It's expensive. Give me this. No, no, can we give you this and this and that? No, 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 that's enough. I'll be full. Why, why throwing $200 to the garbage? I'll manage with this only. You see a table next to you have 20 different plates. In the end, they don't eat more than you. 19 plates will go to the garbage eventually. And then they get a bill, $2,000. And you got 200 and he got $2,000. $1,800 went to the garbage. While you're eating, his table is very impressive. Are you jealous with him? No, because you know he's stupid. And because you know soon the bill will be put on his table. And now comes the price. Right or wrong? So why are you worried about when you see all these billionaires? The opposite. If you had their money and you would be stingy and you would not make valet tshuva and you will not donate to Kiruv, and you will not sponsor yeshivot, you will be in the biggest mess of your history. Because Hashem is going to hold you responsible for all the tragedies that happened that could have been prevented. Especially when Hashem sends you people to knock on your door and to make a request from you, and you turn them down. And now Hashem will show you every time you say no, or every time you were about to click the donation button, and in the end, your Yetzer Hara convinced you not to. What would have happened if you actually clicked the button? Imagine, imagine this, and I want to finish right here. Imagine this, Rabotai. I'm telling you things that you know inside you that is the reality. You come in front of Hashem, and He will show you when you were, I don't know, 50 years old, and you had plenty of money, and you had an opportunity to do something very big. Sponsor a lecture help the yeshiva, sponsor the whole month of the yeshiva. You had an opportunity, and you had the money, it wouldn't affect your cash flow at all. You wouldn't even realize. If you would have done it, that particular month, it will be another 20 new ballet tshuva. And one of them, one day, will be the new Rav Ovadia, And it will be yours. All the Torah of him in the world will be all yours. Since you didn't click, where did the money go to? To that one, to this one, to, to stupid things. To buy another boat, to buy, you know, things that, more clothes, more jewelry. It stays in the drawer. Another watch in a safe. And what happened in the end? Some of this money will be left to your non-religious kids. And they marry the goyot. And all the money will go to there, or to drugs, or who knows to where. Now you stand in the court of heaven, and Hashem will show you what happened with your money. And he will show you what would have happened if you actually click the donate button. And you see what you just lost. And that's only one incident. 
then it will multiply it in a period of eight years of life. And let's see where you're going to hide. I'm talking to myself here. I'm not preaching to you. Every one of us has to think like that. Just like that, go in a film. This could have been that. And, the, and sometimes people say, Rabbi, don't be so strict. I also give a lot of tzedakah. It's never enough. Because tzedakah doesn't go by the number. It goes by how much you could have given. And usually you don't even give 10% of what you should. That's the people. That's the, the way it is. The reality of it. Why? Because what do you think? The Satan is going to let you give to such an important cause. He's going to fight you to death. And the sad part is that in the end, you lose that money anyway. That's, you know, one time there was a fundraising. And that year, they sent person, personal invitation to every one of the people that, ev that give a lot of money every year in a dinner. They have annual dinner. One wealthy person, that was 2008. That year got wiped out. He had a big company for loans, mortgages, went bankrupt. They took away everything he had and he left without a dollar. Now they, the organization didn't know if to invite him to the dinner or not. For many years he was giving every year a $100,000 donation each year. Now we know he's not going to give a dollar. Now if we don't invite him... It's going to look very bad. He's going to say, oh, when I was rich, they always make sure to invite me. Now they know I don't have what to give, so they throw me to the garbage. It looks terrible, right? It looks like ungratefulness. But if we invite him, he will feel horrible that all the other people give, and he sits there like nothing, and he cannot even give a dollar. So they ask the rabbi, rabbi, what should we do? The rabbi said, when you don't know what to do, you do nothing. What do you mean? We don't send him an invitation and we don't tell him not to come. Let's see what he's going to do. If he will show up, we treat him like a king. If he won't show up and later he's going to ask why we didn't invite him, we will apologize and so say we didn't want to embarrass you. Because we knew your financial situation, we didn't want you to feel bad. We apologize. We, we're still very grateful to what you did. There's a way around it. One day before the dinner he called. How come I didn't get an invitation this year? That's the phone call you were afraid the most. How come you never invited me? Oh, we didn't know if it will upset you or not because we know that you're running to difficulties. Invite me. I want to be there. Not only I'm going to be there, I want to be the first person that speak because every one of these rich people come on a stage to say, how he's proud, and they make a video to send to other rich people. Fundraising. They say, you want to speak? But we, are, we already have the schedule. Who speaks when? Okay, let's talk to the rabbi. Rabbi insists to be the first one that speak. The rabbi say, even though it's the last thing I wanted, but what are we going to do? Start a fight with him? It can affect our other donors. They would see how we react. So we have to agree. We have no choice. Tell him okay. And he got on a stage. This happened after 2008. And he said, all of you are probably wondering what am I doing here tonight? And you're now even more wondering why am I why I'm standing on a stage since I did not give a dollar this year and I won't be able to give any. Why I'm wasting your time speaking here? Only people that donate get to speak. But I'll tell you why I'm here. Before the crash, last year, when I was here giving 100,000, easily I could have given two, three million dollars and it wouldn't bother me. I could have given two, three million dollars and I would move on with my life like nothing happened. I gave 100,000, everyone clap like I'm some kind of a generous guy. And what happened to all the millions? Everything got lost. Do you know how horrible I feel now that every year that I was here, I only gave 100,000 and I could have given two, three million? Imagine the last 10 years, I would give another 30 million. At least this would be sent to my next world. That money will, would not be wiped out. Now I left without the donation and without the money. 
That's why I wanted here to come here to warn you not to make the mistake I made last year. You never know, maybe next year you'll be in my situation, God forbid. And it will never, never stop bothering you. Now why I didn't give when I had the money? Because once you give it, it's waiting for you for the eternal world. If you didn't and you lost it, you are bold from both sides now. You didn't give it, so you didn't get the donation, and you didn't have the money. You got wiped out from both sides. It's needless to say how much more money they raised that night, thanks to him. And the rabbi told him, who would ever believe that the year that you could not give a, a dollar from your pocket, you gave the most, more than all the years you gave combined. Because the extra that we made, thanks to your five-minute speech, was more than you gave us in all the ten years of dinners. Without a dollar, you raise more funds than ever. That's what the Gemara in Masechet Baba Batra say. Gadol ha-me'aseh, yoter min ha-oseh. Someone that make other Jews do the right thing, like giving donation and kind of... His reward is even greater than them. They get their full reward. But the broker who got them to invest in the right charity gets